It was the 1980s. It was Beverly Hills. It was all about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There was no rules. Designers' names of clothes became important. The labels, the where you shopped, where you had dinner. It was Beverly Hills. And at the center of the scene was the Billionaire Boys Club. Young men from the cream of Beverly Hills elite families. They always got you know, the best service, the best tables. They were led by a charismatic boy wonder named Joe Hunt. He wanted a lot of power. He wanted to be a leader. But his fierce ambition would drive him to disaster. There is one, one voice that will never be stifled. And that's the voice of an innocent man talking about his innocence. A Beverly Hills hotshot's lust for money begins with deceit and ends in deadly desperation. Tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Welcome to Beverly Hills, you have arrived. For nearly 75 years, Beverly Hills has been a haven for the wealthy and celebrated. You'd just die seeing the way people drop cash in Beverly Hills. Shoes and handbags and facials and you know, the, whole, the whole spiel. <laughs> It's unbelievable. In a decade of conspicuous consumption, Beverly Hills was the world capital of shopping. It was all about showing off your wealth, how much you have, and it was decadent to a certain degree. It was a little too much, very excessive. This was the 80s. It was a high-octane atmosphere of greed and fear. And in 1984, it was ignited by one man's ambition and another man's disappearance. On June 8th, Ron Levin, a shady Beverly Hills businessman with a long history of fraud, was reported missing. At first, the police didn't take the report too seriously. I remember Ron Levin from my days in Beverly Hills. He drove a green Rolls Royce. He was brought to my house a couple of times, and I thought he was a creepy guy. Solving the mystery of Ron Levin's disappearance would reveal elaborate con games, kidnapping, and perhaps murder. Levin had last been seen two nights earlier with a young businessman named Joe Hunt. Hunt was a glamorous but mysterious figure in Beverly Hills. Some say he was an investment genius. Others say he was a sinister con man. Who was Joe Hunt? Joe Hunt started out life as Joseph Gamsky in a world very different from Beverly Hills. I grew up in Van Nuys in a very humble little house. It was a dinky little place, uh, you know, crowded, surrounded by other dinky little places, uh, and they were always just barely surviving. Joe's father was an emotionally remote man who worked at a clinic called the American Institute of Hypnosis. His son, Joe, became a guinea pig for his theories about self-hypnosis. He was going to uh, teach Joe the capacity to hypnotize yourself and program yourself for whatever goal you had and, and taught him uh, the whole idea that you just would eliminate any distractions or anything that stood in the way of what you wanted. By the time he was 12, it was clear that Joe was different. He was exceptionally bright with a clear, well-organized mind that was focused on achieving his goals. He easily won a scholarship to the prestigious Harvard Prep School in Beverly Hills. We had some of the top families sending their kids, kids to that school. Everybody was chauffeured over from the west side in Beverly Hills and she would go visit their houses and they were mansions. Joe wanted desperately to be accepted by his rich classmates, but he was awkward and unpolished. Joe knew what it would take to conquer this world, money and power, and he wanted both. 
Joe was clearly attracted to money. I think it's hard to grow up in this city in the kind of circles he grew up in without being aware of money. I don't think that money alone would have done it for Joe. He wanted a lot of power. He wanted to, to be a leader. After graduation, Joe went to USC to study accounting. At 19, he took and passed the CPA exam. He would later claim to be the youngest person in California history to do so. Like many of Joe's claims, it wasn't entirely true. I doubt that he was the youngest person to pass it. He made a lot of claims, and, and it's that, that was part of Joe Hunt, is that there was always a truth to what he was saying, but then he'd push it a little bit further to, to inflate himself. In a hurry to get rich, Joe dropped out of USC in his sophomore year. He showed up at a recruiting meeting for a big downtown accounting firm and told them he, had, he was about to graduate. And uh, they never checked because he immediately presented his, uh, the fact that he passed the CPA's exam, which he'd done as a, right out of high school. Joe got the job, but accounting quickly bored him. In 1981, Joe arrived at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange to make his fortune. When Joe went to Chicago, I think he went in with a great deal of confidence and cockiness that he could, with his brains and, and his little bit of knowledge, make a killing in the commodities market. In fact, commodities trading is a real crapshoot, even for people who really know what they're doing. And Joe had no idea what he was doing. And he, he lost every bit of money he tried to invest. Joe needed to cover his losses, and the rules didn't matter. He solicited investors and started investing their money. He wasn't licensed to run an investment group, but he proceeded to set one up anyway. And when word of that got to the authorities at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Joe made the major mistake of initially trying to charm and then to intimidate and then to outbattle the vice president of the Merck. So he escalated to the point of total destruction. Joe was immediately kicked out of the exchange. I've met lots of guys like Joe. Big setbacks don't phase them. Nothing's ever their fault. And failure only makes them bolder. So Joe packed his bags and headed back to Beverly Hills with big plans. When we return, Joe Gamsky becomes Joe Hunt and returns to Beverly Hills, intent on making a killing. In 1981, Joseph Gamsky returned to Beverly Hills with a new, classier name, Joe Hunt, and a new scheme to make his fortune. This kid really only had two things going for him, his ambition and his rich friends from school. He came up with a plan that would put both to work. Joe decided to form an investment club. His friends would provide the capital, and Joe, as the leader, would use their money to trade commodities. He named it the BBC. The BBC got its name because there was a restaurant in Chicago that was called the Bombay Bicycle Club, and it was a place that Joe Hunt liked to hang out at. So when they came out here and were starting a group, they called it the BBC after that restaurant in Chicago. Um, it later jokingly became referred to as the Billionaire Boys Club. Hunt's powers of persuasion were evident from the start as he instilled in the BBC a set of principles he called paradox philosophy. Paradox philosophy is really about a way of justifying whatever you do. It, it, it's distilled to its simplest form. It's the ends justify the means regardless of anything. Joe's first two recruits were former classmates Dean Carney and Ben Dosty. Others soon followed. All were from wealthy families and all had no idea how to make it on their own. 
Rich, spoiled, and insecure, they were perfect for Joe. He almost seemed like everybody's savior. I mean, he had this, this quality about him. He just struck everybody who got to know him as the person you wanted to be with who could help you achieve your goals, whether they were financial or personal. Whatever it was, Joe was like this rock. In the fall of 1982, two more former classmates joined the BBC, Tom and David May. The May brothers, the heirs to the May Company fortunes, joined this, the Billionaire's Boys Club, to think that, that they had gotten it on their own rather than have it handed on a silver tray. With the May brothers on board, even more members and money came pouring in. In the beginning, they had quite a lot of success raising money. Um, and that was the real, that was the real importance of the, of the young men Joe brought into the group, was that they had contacts, and their contacts went deep into the community. He was able to get inside that, that circle, uh, Beverly Hills, Bel Air. I mean, it snowballed. Joe opened a trading account at the prestigious firm of Cantor Fitzgerald and began buying and selling high-risk commodities. He was sure he couldn't lose, and at first, he didn't. Joe started off at Cantor Fitzgerald and actually was successful. In no time, Joe soon had, you know, actually ultimately had about a couple of million dollars in his um, investment accounts. Joe soon leased an expensive suite of offices at the Wells Fargo building in the heart of Beverly Hills for the BBC. He spent thousands and thousands of dollars making sure he and the other members of the group looked and behaved like big shots. Expensive dinners at Spago, $4,000 Armani suits, and German sports cars. He wanted everybody to see him as the successful person that he considered himself. He wanted people to see him as a, you know, a major success, as, as a real hotshot. And they became a very identifiable group. Um, and you know, they would show up places all dressed alike, either in business suits one time or tuxedos if they went to some formal function. People knew that many of them were connected to very wealthy and prominent families, and they knew how to trade on that. They were impeccably dressed with designer suits. They had late model expensive cars. Uh, you know, the Rolex watches. They had all of the accoutrements to impress. The BBC tried to start a business converting European luxury cars to U.S. standards, but profits became less important than pleasure. They had a fleet of cars. Actually, they, 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 they bought all of these uh, BMW 700 series sedans that they were supposed to be fixing up and selling, but they liked driving them so much that they became the BBC fleet. They added uh, a couple of Mercedes and a Rolls Royce along the way. One of the secretaries at the BBC described it to me as really what these boys were doing was putting on daddy's business suit and coming in and playing office. And I think that was a really apt description. With his investors happy, Joe continued to take big risks in the market. He made bets or, or placed uh, money and investments that long term would have paid off in a very large way but he could never contain himself you have to manage your money to run an effective investment operation and he would always go so far out on a limb with his margins that if there was a slight slip at any point he wasn't covered and that it endlessly tripped him up the money joe hunt was playing with was real and he started losing a lot of it in the commodities market Soon, he was using new investors' money to pay off other investors and create the illusion they were making money. People were just handing him thousands and thousands of dollars, their life savings. I mean, whatever, whatever money they had, they were saying, here, Joe, you're the man. You can do it. I mean, we trust you implicitly. He was actually making money for a little while, and then when it, he stopped making money, he kept paying as if he was making profits and then turned it into essentially a Ponzi scheme. Joe's business had become a house of cards. Joe Hunt was the kind of guy who believed his own hype. But he had to know that this elaborate scheme couldn't go on forever without a big payoff. 
In the spring of 1983, Joe met the man who would change the life of everyone in the BBC. 40-year-old Ron Levin was a well-known figure at the trendiest restaurants and clubs in Beverly Hills. I would see him at uh, Le Dome. He had a, a table that he was constantly there. I remember seeing him at Spago, uh, uh, at uh, the Beverly Hills Hotel, at the Polo Lounge. Levin was a businessman with a trail of fraudulent schemes behind him. He'd been arrested several times for theft and fraud. Like Joe, he believed the secret to success was image. He used to say, if you have a Rolls and a Rolex, you can do anything. You can be anybody. To him, this was the way the world is. You know, I steal from you, you steal from somebody else. When I, when I con you, I'm giving you a lesson. Levin and Hunt each saw a lot of himself in the other. They saw themselves as outsiders who were smarter than these rich kids. And when they met each other, they realized, no, this is somebody I can have fun competing with and against. And, and so they, you know, I mean, the gamesmanship began as soon as they met. What Ron didn't realize is how determined Joe was to win and how far he'd go. Joe needed Levin's cash. He kept at him to invest in the BBC. And finally, Levin did. I think that for Joe Hunt, Ron Levin was a dream come true. He continued to believe that if he just got a big chunk of money he could put in the commodities market, everything would turn out okay. And so Ron Levin comes along and says, okay, yeah, you've convinced me, here's $5 million to invest for me. Levin agreed to split the profits, but insisted on using his own account at the Clayton brokerage. With Levin's money, Joe began making huge profits. He could point to a statement with a bottom line that read $13.5 million. Joe's share would be $5 million. So he strolls into the office with all these documents from Clayton Brokerage that tell all the boys that, that he's just made $5 million for them and it's all going into the BBC and then he holds a meeting at which he assigns shares of the profits and tells the May as well, you'll get 800,000 each you know, on down the line. The boys were ecstatic. For Joe, the big commission came just in time. Unbeknownst to his partners, Joe had spent nearly all of their money on looking successful rather than actually being successful. It was very important to Joe that he had made those profits and could show them to his followers. Mind you, these were, for the most part, young men who didn't need to be a part of the BBC to succeed in life. And they wouldn't stay around for too long if nothing was happening there. But when Joe asked Levin for his share of the profits, Levin stalled. Weeks passed and Levin continued to make excuses. Joe initially didn't suspect, then wasn't sure, then wouldn't believe and finally was convinced that the account was was a, uh, a fraud as joe would learn later there had never been any money in the account at all the whole thing had been a scam by levin part of a fraud the older con man was running on someone else joe had been levin's pawn by then joe had gotten himself in a position where he needed that five million dollars to cover losses and expense. I mean, expenses, BBC's overhead at that point was enormous. He knew he had to have a huge infusion of cash by the end of the summer of 1984, or it was all gonna collapse. Although Dean Carney, his first recruit and best friend, stuck with him, other investors, feeling misled, were asking for their money back. There was nothing. It was just his word. Okay, you said, you know, we were supposed to be, this was supposed to be happening by now, and it's not. What's the deal? Well, we experienced a slight snag. It's no big deal, really. He had lost a lot of money on a lot of fronts. He was desperate to keep the group together. And he, he also really needed money. On June 6th, Joe and BBC member Jim Pittman had paid a visit to Ron Levin's Beverly Hills apartment. The next day, Joe arrived at the office with a $1.5 million check drawn on a Swiss bank account and signed by Levin. 
The only way to keep a scheme like this afloat is to keep putting cash in. It seemed like Ron Levin's check was going to save the Billionaire Boys Club. But when Joe took the check to the bank, it bounced. Joe Hunt and conman Ron Levin had engaged in a duel of wits for nearly a year. Joe had gotten a check from Ron for $1.5 million, but the check bounced. Two days later, Ron Levin was reported missing. At first, the police were not concerned. Most cops will privately tell you they hate running down missing persons. And with a shady guy like Ron Levin, let's just say the police weren't rushing to find him. When the report was taken, you know, we saw that it was Ron Levin, my partner and I, and we looked at it and said, you know, Ron's at his tricks again. By summer's end, Joe was running out of money and his followers were losing faith. Although his best friend Dean Carney remained loyal, David May, who had lost a bundle with Joe, was increasingly disillusioned. Joe could only really count on Dean Carney and a new member, Reza Eslaminia. Reza's father had fled Iran with millions of dollars, money that Joe and Reza were planning to take for themselves, but their plans were doomed from the start. Like a lot of wealthy Iranians who left because they were allies of the Shah, Hadayat Eslamenia did not have as much money once he got to the United States as he'd had in Iran. Um, his assets in Iran were frozen and neither Reza nor anyone else in his family could get access to them. A few months after Reza and Joe met, Reza's father disappeared. Most people assumed his political enemies were behind it. No one suspected Joe Hunt. Hadayat Eslamenia was actively involved in opposing the Ayatollah Khomeini. So there was a lot of, of worry in the beginning that he'd been abducted or killed by people who were in the employ of Khomeini. Then, on August 8th, Joe's house of cards started tumbling down. Beverly Hills detective Les Zoller got a call from a lawyer representing Tom and David May. They wanted to meet the police to tell them how Joe Hunt had swindled them out of thousands of dollars. And there was something else they knew about Hunt, something they thought would interest the police. For Joe Hunt, the noose was tightening. He'd preyed on his wealthy Beverly Hills friends for over two years. But let me tell you, people who have a lot of money still don't like to lose it. We met on Sunset Boulevard at the attorney for the May brothers' father. And they started saying, you know, that uh, Ron Levin had known Joe Hunt. And when Ron Levin set up a an account for Joe to trade in. It was through the Clayton Brokerage Company, and it was a phony account. It was a scam. The May brothers said that after Joe found out that Levin had conned him, he had called a meeting of the BBC. He was just beside himself. And during this meeting, Joe disclosed that Joe and Jim had uh, done away with Ron Levin or... You know, they didn't exactly say kill, but the inference was that he was killed. Up to that point, the only, the only person in the group who'd known was Dean Carney. At that point, there was general chaos in the group as people were trying to contemplate what to do next. The police were astonished at Tom and Dave May's accusation. They obtained a warrant to search Levin's apartment, where they made an incredible discovery. As they're searching his office, behind a wastebasket, they find this list of seven pages. And on the front is a to-do list. So I look at it, and it has various items of things to do. And, you know, it was things like close blinds, kill dog, you know, so on and so forth. And that pretty much cinched it for me. The handwriting on the to-do list was Joe Hunt's.
In September 1984, the police were getting ready to go after Joe Hunt for the murder of Ron Levin. Inside Ron Levin's apartment, they had found something amazing. A to-do list in Joe's handwriting, detailing all the steps of the murder. You know, it always seems to be the little things that bring the big guys down. What was Joe Hunt thinking? It's bad enough to make such a list, but to leave it behind at the crime scene, it was a damning piece of evidence, enough to make an arrest. On October 22nd, as Joe drove out of the garage of his luxury condominium, police arrested him for the murder of Ron Levin. Joe was cocky and nonchalant until Zoller showed him the to-do list. I put a copy of the seven pages in front of Joe Hunt and I said, what do you know about these? And I could see the color drain from his face. And he picked the pages up and he looked at each page and he flipped to the next page and it seemed like he read every word in it. And he kept looking and looking and finally, after giving him an opportunity to look at him, I said, what do you know of those? And he looked at me and he says, I think I should contact my attorney. Hunt immediately hired one of Beverly Hills' most expensive, highest profile lawyers, Arthur Barons. They had been speaking with a variety of lawyers uh, regarding some of the issues facing Joe at that time, and then they had gotten back to me and asked me if I'd proceed on his behalf. But even as Barons was trying to build a defense, the police were going after the BBC member to whom Joe had confided everything, Dean Carney. Dean Carney was in really deep. And how Dean Carney ever got into the position he was in is a mystery to me. This is a kid from a nice family, and he fell so under the sway of Joe Hunt that it's incomprehensible. On November 26th, Detective Zoller met Dean at his parents' house in the Hollywood Hills. He made Dean an offer he couldn't refuse. They gave Dean carte blanche, I mean, a deal that nobody could have imagined he'd get, which was complete freedom. You know, he, he was able to walk away scot-free if he testified. He realized that he needed out of this, that either this was the end of his life, that he would spend the rest of his life in prison, or he would rat out his friend Joe Hunt. And in the end, he ratted out Joe Hunt. Dean corroborated the story the May brothers had told. Joe and BBC member Jim Pittman had killed Ron Levin. Then Carney dropped a bombshell on the detective. He told them Joe was behind another murder, the death of Hediot Eslaminia, father of BBC member Reza Eslaminia. The plan was to kidnap him and bring him down to Southern California and put him in this basement and then torture him until he gave up the information about his assets. But according to Dean, the plan had gone horribly wrong. They went to where he lived, got let in as delivery people, had a huge box with them, a big trunk, used some chloroform to knock him out, put him in the trunk, and then put him in the back of a U-Haul that they'd rented in Los Angeles and driven up there. He died probably of asphyxiation on the way down from San Francisco. They were knuckleheads. I mean, it's like, don't you learn at the earliest you capture a butterfly, you make the hole so they can breathe? I mean, that's pretty, pretty basic. Dean told Zoller that he and Joe had dumped the body in Soledad Canyon. Two days later, Dean led the detective to the spot. I looked under a, a bush and I saw the, a skull and then Within a couple of feet of the skull, I saw the bottom jawbone with teeth in it. So that was key in identifying the remains of Hidiot Eslamenia because of the dental records. On December 8, 1985, Joe Hunt was charged with a second murder, the killing of Hediot Eslamenia. The two murder charges shocked Beverly Hills. I think it was such a big scandal because it surprises you that there could be such chaos in a life that you perceive to be so 
perfect. So Beverly Hills perfect. Every time someone else was arrested or something else was uncovered, you kind of paid more attention to it. Despite its flash and its money, Beverly Hills has always preferred to keep its scandals to itself. But the Billionaire Boys Club was different. When the trial began, it set a new benchmark for media hype. The uh, press was fascinated with uh, Joe Hunt, his philosophy, the other young men that he was associated with. Certainly, uh, there were a lot of very fascinating aspects to the story. At the trial, prosecutors started with Joe's motives. They told the jury that Ron Levin had scammed Joe, and Joe was angry. He wanted revenge, and he wanted money from Levin. He and BBC bodyguard Jim Pittman had gone to Levin's apartment the night of June 6th, determined to get both. Ron Levin had always bragged that he had a Swiss bank account. So Joe Hunt really decided that he would go and force Ron Levin to write a check from that Swiss bank account to him that Joe could cash and that he would kill Ron Levin after he got the check because he needed the money um, and he needed Ron Levin not to be there to cancel the check. Jim shot him in the back of the head and then they carried the body out to the trunk of a BMW and drove it up into the Angeles National Forest, Soledad Canyon, where Joe and Jim had already dug a grave. But despite extensive searches, the police couldn't locate Levin's body. Any reference to the defendant's alleged statement? Joe's lawyers said that Levin wasn't dead at all, that after swindling the BBC, the master con man had simply slipped out of town to escape any consequences. We had to prove that Ron Levin wasn't only missing, but that he had been murdered. So we had to show that his disappearance wasn't just a disappearance, it's because he was dead. It's tough to convict someone of murder without a body, especially when the alleged victim had as many reasons to disappear as Ron Levin. The primary question the jury had to answer was, was Ron Levin dead or alive? The trial of Joe Hunt for the murder of Ron Levin was underway. It was all anyone in Beverly Hills talked about. At exclusive restaurants, dinner parties, and behind the walls of Beverly Hills mansions, people were talking about the mysterious case of Joe Hunt, Ron Levin, and the Billionaire Boys Club. Everyone had a theory. But the only one that mattered would be the one the jury believed. One of the defense's biggest challenges was explaining away Joe's handwritten to-do list. On the third day of the trial, the prosecution presented the list. It was a damning piece of evidence. This is a guy who is so meticulous that he writes down every step before he kills Ron Levin. Kill dog, close curtains, all of these things on this list. He's that meticulous, and yet he leaves it behind. What? What's that about? If it hadn't been for leaving the list, this probably would have never unraveled and he probably never would have been even arrested for either of these crimes. The prosecution put a parade of BBC members on the stand. We had the different members come forward and testify about this uh, June 24th meeting that they had in the Wilshire Manning where Joe Hunt disclosed that we did away with Ron Levin. The last witness on the stand was Joe's best friend, Dean Carney. When he started talking, you could have heard a pin drop in the courtroom. This was the moment we'd all been waiting for. Dean Carney had been Joe Hunt's dearest friend. And now suddenly, here he was, sitting in the witness box, pointing the finger, saying, You, my former best friend, you are a murderer. Dean spoke of himself and what he'd done with you know, sort of self-contempt that was disturbing but convincing. During their cross-examination of Carney, Joe's lawyers argued that Joe had merely been bragging about the murder to impress his friends. I think Hunt's entire portrait with these young men was self-constructed and grandiose. 
the capability of committing homicide to avenge an alleged wrongdoing or a scam where Ron Levin had victimized them seemed consistent with his exaggeration to me. They did have other instances where Joe had boasted of things he hadn't done. He told about some fight he'd had uh, with a Mexican gang member out at the Sepulveda Reservoir, where he'd end up having to, to kill him with his own knife. And so, I mean, there were these, these boasts of, of, uh, of that he killed people uh, that were false, so this could have been another one. As for the list, the defense noted that it lacked one key instruction, kill Levin. The defense claimed that after Levin gave Joe the worthless $1.5 million check, Levin packed his bags and left. And they called witnesses to support their theory. There was a couple from Arizona who testified that they had seen him at a gas station uh, well after the uh, disappearance in Arizona. I think it maybe it raised a little doubt, but um, for one thing, you know, these people would claim to have seen Ron Levin out of the corner of their eye as they're driving by. It's, it doesn't wash. Prosecutors dismissed the Levin sightings as preposterous. So did Ron Levin's father. If my son was alive, he would get in touch with me and his mother. There is no doubt in my mind. Barons argue that there was plenty of room for doubt. Joe was no killer. He was the victim of Levin's scam. I presented him as I felt accurately and that he was a brilliant young man. He'd certainly uh, been a young man that had made mistakes, that he was a victim to a degree of his own ambition, but that certainly wasn't tantamount to a murderer. The trial concluded on April 22nd, but the jury never heard a word from the leading man, Joe Hunt. There was a point in the trial where Joe had the opportunity to take the stand on his own behalf. And I believe that he wanted to. To a lot of people, the decision not to take the stand made Joe Hunt look guilty. But most defense attorneys will tell you that letting the prosecution cross-examine their client is far worse. So Joe Hunt remained an enigma, even as the jury filed out to determine his fate. When we return, the verdict in the Ron Levin murder trial. On April 22, 1987, a California jury announced they had reached a verdict in Joe Hunt's trial for the murder of Ron Levin. If convicted, Joe could face the death penalty. There's nothing quite like the heightened sense of anticipation when the jury announces they have reached a verdict. And this was no exception. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Joe Hunt, guilty of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187. Joe Hunt's long run of fooling the world had finally ended. He had one hope left, that the jury would sentence him to life imprisonment, not the gas chamber. For Ron Levin's father, the choice was clear. What do I think of him? Mm -hmm. What would you like to see him get? I'd like to see him die. That's what I'd like to see him. I hereby sentence you to state prison for life without the possibility of parole. The first vote was a majority voted for death. Um, the handful who wanted to, to vote for life, you know, they, they used that argument that all these other boys are just about as guilty as him and they're getting away. The jury said they strongly considered the death penalty. My personal opinion is, is that a jury would just have a hard time putting somebody to death on a no-body case. I mean, here you have people coming forward that said, we've seen Ron Levin, although we discounted that. I think in the back of their mind, they're always thinking, what if, what if? But it wasn't over for Joe Hunt. He had another murder trial to look forward to, where he would again face the death penalty, this time for the murder of Hediot Eslamini. From prison, Joe began preparing for his upcoming trial. 
Ever confident in his abilities, Joe decided to act as his own attorney. This would be Joe Hunt's ultimate test. He was putting his fate squarely in his own hands. Joe had conned his friends and investors, but could he con the jury? The trial for the murder of Hediat Eslaminia began on April 14, 1992. There is one, one voice that will never be stifled, and that's the voice of an innocent man talking about his innocence. And I am an innocent man. I am not a murderer. Everything's possible with Joe. The fact that he started representing himself in the San Mateo trial and was so effective without having any formal legal training, how he conducted that second trial was really astounding to me. In this case, there was a body. Joe couldn't deny that a murder had been committed. What he could do was blame someone else for it, the friend who had betrayed him, Dean Carney. I think that time after time, Joe Hunt's animosities got in the way of his rational thinking and to blame this whole murder on dean carney i just don't think it was believable joe offered the jury a bizarre story hediat eslamenia he said had been afraid of a death threat by the ayatollah khomeini eslamenia had asked the bbc to fake his kidnapping to keep him safe joe and some bbc members had gone house hunting in the la suburb of beverly glen looking for a suitable hideout. The home was in kind of a state of disrepair and they wanted to see the basement. Didn't seem to be interested in seeing any of, any of the rest of the house. So after some time, they came back up and uh, they said, we'll take it. Joe claimed that after they abducted Eslamenia, Dean Carney was supposed to guard him. It's a cockamamie story. I mean, that Dean was left alone with Eslamenia and decided to kill him because I guess there was some supposed to be, you know, lots of money and gold in the in the trunk or something. Dean had both panicked and been consumed, overcome by greed. Anyway, Dean killed Eslamenia. Throughout his testimony, Joe had the jury on the edge of their seats. The jurors all said. Joe Hunt was one of the greatest defense lawyers I've ever seen, but he was not a very good witness for himself on the stand because he had to tell a story that was absurd on its face. Despite the absurd story, Joe's charisma was as potent as ever. On December 10th, 1992, the jury announced they could not reach a verdict. A mistrial was declared, and the state chose not to retry the case. Joe returned to prison to serve a life sentence for the murder of Ron Levin. The story of the Billionaire Boys Club was over. What people would debate for years was how Joe had lured so many children of privilege into his web of deceit and murder. I think that Joe was offering something irresistible. He was reaching these kids at a moment in their lives when they felt very vulnerable. That, that great chasm they had to cross from childhood to adulthood. He was there. And he was telling them, look, here's the bridge. It's not hard at all. You don't even have to have a lifestyle change. Follow me and life's easy. Joe Hunt will spend the rest of his life in a California prison, far from the luxurious trappings of Beverly Hills that he craved. As for the other members of the BBC, none of them spent any meaningful time behind bars. Joe Hunt may have led them to the edge of a cliff, but only he ended up going over it. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.